all of you. Glad to see such a good crowd at the environmental conference. Before I get started, I'd like to make a few announcements. Two station wagons are parked by the kitchen here, and they would like to move as soon as possible. For all education students that wish to be interviewed by Dawson Creek, you're requested to see Bill Schwartz. My name is John Nestroff, and at this moment, I'd like to introduce Dr. Roland Grant, the president of Notre Dame University, who will have some introductory remarks. Can you hear me from here? All right? I've never spoken in here before, so I don't know whether I can uh, be heard or not. Uh, I don't have a speech, so it'll take quite a while. But I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, Notre Dame University. The university is very pleased to be able to act as the environment for your conference and uh, wish it all the best. And we'd like particularly to uh, congratulate all those who have put so much time and work into organizing what seems, and I know is, uh, a very promising uh, array of talks and discussions. Um, I have, of course, a personal concern as well. And it's almost, I would say, a selfish concern because there are times when, uh, looking at all the silos materials passing through my office, I have to run to the windows and see if the trees are still on the hills. And I hope that um, the uh, value of education uh, towards preserving, enhancing, and uh, perhaps proper use of the environment is the first sign of sanity in this world. The, uh, the harbinger, perhaps, of uh, more restraint, the, uh, of uh, more humility, uh, responsibility, and perhaps compassion. And I'd like to think that the environmental movement, which we are now embedding in our educational system, is in fact the first signpost of the new age. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grant. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speakers for this session. The first speaker that we'll hear is Mr. Tom O'Keefe. He was the first vice president of the Canadian Wildlife Federation. He was the director of the Alberta Wilderness Society, the director of the Calgary Eco Center. He was the former president of the Alberta Wildlife Federation. His topic for today is the environmental is environmental education today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to express my appreciation to the members of the committee and uh, Bob Harrington particularly for this invitation. You may wonder why somebody with the presumed credentials that I have is speaking on environmental education. When Bob phoned me on this, I had a couple of discussions with him. I said, Bob, I've been to an awful lot of meetings like this and sat back and thought to myself, and as some of you may know, got up and very vocally commented on the theoretical experts and the practical nitwits that you sometimes get at a gathering like this. Well, now, on environmental education, I'm afraid that at this time, I've got to confess to being the theoretical expert. However, in our discussions with Bob, I was very fortunate in convincing him of this and the gentleman who will be following me is probably one of the foremost practical experts in Western Canada or all of Canada from what I understand. So my remarks are going to be very short. If you'll bear with me and 
realize that the practical aspects of the comments on environmental education are going to follow what I have to say. When you get involved, as I have, with the term environmental education, it seems to mean different things to everybody. And when you talk to a golfer, his environment is 40 acres of land that he sees. And as long as there's a power vacuum out there to clean up the leaves in the fall, he thinks that his environment's pretty good. If you get a downhill skier, he goes many, many miles every year over the same 4,000 feet. And if he doesn't have to worry about a crowded highway and there's lots of snow, to him, he's solved all his environmental problems. So my comments today are going to evolve around the environmental problems as I see them as a hunter and a fisherman. I read a paper on environmental education in Canada that was a presentation at the Man and Environment Conference held in Toronto. Policies across Canada of the various departments of education were described in that, and it seems that there were more non-policies by education departments than there were firm commitments to the fact that environmental education was either necessary or was a problem. The Western provinces, they referred to kind of a catch-all phrase, and they called it an integrated policy, whereby they assumed that teachers would put environmental education into science and biology and so on. The concern seemed to be more the cleaning up of existing problems rather than solving anything. And in British Columbia, it gives the impression that what is good for forestry and mining is environmentally acceptable. And most of the teaching aids that I have been able to see come from the forestry industry, forest industry, to give that bias to the teaching that may be done or may be derived from those aids. The educational aids on the prairie provinces all seem to come, be directed, come from industry and be directed towards pollution. Now, I don't think we have as serious a problem on, with pollution in the prairie provinces as there is in places like eastern Canada. And it's very likely that the politicians think that pollution is something that is politically acceptable to talk about if any little thing is done, that a great deal seems to be done because of the fact that there is that no great problem to start with. They never seem to get down to the root causes of the problem. In Ontario, the educators are doing a great deal of work in a technical way. Their approach seems to be that science, technology, the engineers, the scientists got, it in, got us into this mess, and they're very well qualified to get us out of the mess. The maritime provinces in Quebec have no policy on environmental education in the schools. In British Columbia, the Department of Recreation, Travel and Industry, and in Alberta, our Department of Recreation, uh, Parks and Wildlife, have two very good programs on environmental education. In Alberta, there are over 10,000 students participated last year in programs directly involved with the environment. There were over 5,500 students were involved in outdoor camps, uh, one near Calgary and one near Edmonton. These are three-day programs at which the environment, wildlife, gun handling are taught. Uh, gun handling may be a, a bad thing to have in the environment with some people. And in Alberta, the programs are being changed now to where one will be a gun qualification program uh, to be compatible with proposed federal legislation. And the other program will involve more uh, what people might call conventional work. Our wildlife federations in Saskatchewan are very, very active in environmental education, as is the Canadian Wildlife Federation on a national scale. Now, there are many things that end up probably in the hands of the converted and the average person doesn't know where to get a hold of them. This is a 70-page instruction manual on firearms in the outdoors that the Alberta Fish and Game uh, prepares. Fish and Wildlife Division in British Columbia have a terrific course that they put out, and there are as, almost as many people in BC taking that course as there are in Alberta. 
nationally through our Canadian Wildlife Federation, the booklet put out on endangered wildlife in Canada. There have been over 300,000 copies of that booklet distributed through the schools so far. We also have an Ottawa report that deals with any problems coming up in the Federal House relating to the environment. This is one of the booklets that is sent out every year during National Wildlife Week. Those are all available as teaching aids through the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Manitoba Wildlife Federation has an excellent book that contains a lot of editorial comment, but many, many comments, articles on the environment as it relates to hunting and fishing, as does New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Those are all related to the various wildlife federations that I've been involved with. I think education is becoming more and more specialized all the time. Groups such as ours, who are amateurs, uh, non-professionals, are very often uh, looked at with a very jaundiced eye by the people who call themselves professionals in the field of education. I think that there's a real problem there. Uh, the associations, such as I work with, could be used a great deal more. The ex a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, a lot of teaching aids and equipment are there that are not taken advantage of. There's a real problem when somebody's trying to run a course or curriculum, and they've got to rely on amateurs. And I know that, or I'm assuming that Reg will make some comments on that later on this morning of how you can't rely on them. There's got to be something done to take advantage of that fund of knowledge. Because people who are active in the outdoors, I think, have a much greater appreciation of the environmental problems that go on than people who live in the city. Eighty-some percent of the people in Calgary never leave that city other than possibly a two-week holiday. They have no idea what the problems are. Kids in the city now, as long as there's a plastic bag, they figure you've got milk. They don't realize that a cow has to have grass. We're going to have a problem. The solution is going to be a long time coming. And I don't think it's going to be a voluntary solution. It's going to be a result of the energy crisis. It's going to be the result of a lack of population control, growing shortages of food. You talk about a food shortage, shortage of land. All you've got to do is go a few miles north of here and look at those... Uh, Sahara Desert mud flats and dust storms that you get at the cusp every year and you wonder who decided that a dam should be put in there to take agricultural production like that uh, out of use. You wonder whether or not air conditioners for the Americans are worth it. You wonder the same thing with automobiles and whether we need uh, a second small car that we buy from Japan and end up having to strip mine a place like the Elk Valley or Edmonton so that we can ship that coal to Japan so that we can make enough money to buy the car back from them. We don't realize that in stripping the Elk Valley that we build a super port at Roberts Bank which destroys miles and miles of the environment, fish, birds in that area. We don't realize that the drying process and the electrical energy needed for coal in the province of British Columbia requires over half the production of the Bennett Dam. When you object to opening a new strip mine, you don't realize that it has an effect on the environment three, four, or five hundred miles away. And those are the things that people don't realize they're not going to realize as long as they stay in the classroom. That's why I think that one of the solutions to environmental education is getting kids out of the classroom where they can see these things. The Alternatives are there if people can be shown what these alternatives are. I think that its worst environmental education is going to carry on trying to teach us to solve problems that are already there. That doesn't work. It's a cosmetic or band-aid effect that hasn't been successful in the past. It's not going to be successful in the future. At its best, it's going to demonstrate that the alternatives are not unacceptable. But I think most important of all, it's going to show us that sooner or later, you really have no choice but to obey the laws of nature, because they're the ones that are going to rule in the end. Thank you.
Metro Pier. I think you opened the eyes of some people that weren't aware of precisely what you talking about. Our next speaker is Mr. Reg Houghton. Mr. Houghton is the supervisor of off-campus activities for the Calgary Board of Education. During his career, he has he has had the position that include all areas in education. He has his baccalaureate from the University of Alberta and master's of administration from the University of Calgary. He's married and has two children. His topic for today is to try to provide us a model for environmental outdoor education. If I may, I would rather speak from here. Uh, I don't mean to suggest that uh, I don't want to speak from there exactly, but I find that when I'm dealing with my students, they suspect me if I am separated from them by the desk. And I have no intention to be separated from you by the podium. Can you all hear me then well enough? Good, because normally I'm speaking in a field and there are no acoustics there at all. Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the very generous introduction, uh, the fact that I am married and have two kids may not sound like it has anything to do with anything except that I believe that uh, people who have children and are trying to educate them in the home, as well as seeing them educated in the school, perhaps have an understanding of what it's like to wear two hats. I can talk about children to parents, other parents, but then I also have that rather humbling experience of going to the school to talk to some teacher who is going to tell me about my child. Uh, sometimes wearing the two hats is a kind of an important thing. For no apparent reason, I'm going to tell you a joke. It's supposed to be a joke. You may not recognize it as such. It, the story goes that in Calgary in the old days, there was a, an Indian who regularly was in the town watching things go by. And a cowboy entered the town, and as he rode by where the Indian was standing, the Indian made this rather semi-obscene gesture. The cowboy looked at it and said, what? Drove, rode his horse out to the end of town and said, I'm sure I saw that. Turned his horse around, rode back. When he rode by the Indian, the Indian went. The cowboy was still not sure what this was all supposed to mean. Rode out to the other end of town, turned around, drove, rode back. The Indian made the same gesture. So he stopped his horse and he rode over to the Indian and he said, say, I think I know what this means, but I'm not sure what this means. And the Indian said, it's simple. I don't think much of your horse either. <laughs> it is conceivable then as I attempt this morning to, to talk about the system that I represent and the things that we are trying to do that you may not like my pictures and you may not like my ideas either. But I'd like to show you through the vehicle of the pictures that I have, the things that we are trying to do with children of all ages in our system to get them out of the limited environment of the conventional classroom and into the real world. And so if I can uh, take you on a trip through our school system and it's a part of our environmental studies program, you may find it a little bit worthwhile. Now, the pictures are going to be, some of them, very difficult to see, but I'm going to tell you about them, and then when this poor fellow has decided that he's had enough of me on film, it'll be a little easier to view. <laughs> Fair enough? All right. Now, this picture that you can't see, and I'll back up to in just a minute, <clears throat> is really our guidelines booklet. What are you going to do? When you get out into the school situation, if it isn't acceptable by the principal of the school, and if he says that it isn't acceptable because the board doesn't view it as being acceptable, and if the board doesn't see it as being acceptable because the province doesn't see it as being acceptable, you know exactly what you're going to do? You're going to stay right where you are. And so in Alberta, we have managed to get to a system, at least through the mechanism of our board, 
where we have produced this very weak picture of a guidelines document, which, and I'll, I'll have, be leaving copies here with some of your people, which serves to describe the board policy, where the board says, we think outdoor education and environmental studies are a good thing, and we're putting our opinions where our mouth is, and we're going to give you some money to make it happen. Now, what's my job? Well, as we go along, hopefully you'll see. Regulations are things that schools have to abide by, and, the, and most of you teachers, when you get out into the schools, if you're not already there, are going to say, those sons of guns downtown are doing nothing but trying to stop me from doing my thing. But that's not always true. This particular form, which uh, is difficult to read, so I'm going to get a little closer, is filled out by the school, and this particular one tells me that this school is taking a group of students to the Calgary Zoo for the purpose of doing something in environmental studies of a certain type of animal there. Why do they fill out a form? They fill out a form because, A, I want to make very certain that there aren't 150 classes all going to the zoo on the same day. The collision, it would be incredible. The overload on the site, impossible. So as a result, they, we can timetable things. Now my system is a large one, it's too big. I have 84,000 students and 4,400 teachers that I'm trying to deal with. And timetabling that number is an administrative nightmare. But the point that I'm making is that you've got to have some kind of coordinating regulation and it doesn't matter how big you are. The other thing that's worthwhile is, what are you scared about? Are you going to take a group of kids out? If so, what happens if one of them falls and breaks a leg? Who's going to sue whom? And in a sue conscious world, this makes a difference. So, our board, through me, has purchased an insurance policy which guarantees to protect every student in our school system 365 days a year any anywhere on the face of the earth. And I have insurance for groups that are going out over our Easter break to Russia, to Paris, to London, to the United States, and to the park across the street from where the school is. Now, you're not going to really get too enthused about taking people out if it's going to put you in a position of risk. And our board says, we don't want our teachers feeling that way. Let's remove the risk. Let's make it worthwhile and desirable to go with those students. And so the forms come in. Now, we want to make sure that we can help teachers. What about the timid teacher who has never tried it? Do you start the very first day by taking the very first class, 54 miles, to some outdoor position where they're living in tents? Not unless you're out of your tree, you don't. And so through this uh, communication vehicle, our newsletters, we produce information on smaller programs to get you used to the idea of moving children over space. And for example, our Rodeo Royal that takes place in our city this year they have given us 5,000 free spaces for our children to go as a part of an environmental study of the rodeo as it was in the history of Alberta. These are just examples. Carrying on quickly. That is a control board. You can hardly see it. But what it is is a bunch of Venetian blinds laterally with cards tucked into them. And that way I can keep track of who is where. And it's kind of important to know who is where for two reasons. One, if somebody says, where is somebody, you can tell them. And the other is strictly from the standpoint of public relations. I had a CBC reporter come into my office the other day and said, we're thinking of doing a piece on outdoor education, but we want to make it show well in the paper. And, you know, it's got to be newsworthy. Where can we take our photographic uh, team to capture youngsters doing things? Well, if I hadn't had a control board like that, I'd have had the world's worst time to suggest to those people in the public relations domain who we want as our allies, not as our enemies, where they could go and also boggle the guy's mind with the monumental variety of things that are happening. Because last year, as I said, we had 220,000 student moves. Now, where does this cell take place? Well, obviously, if you're smart, it takes place in the playground. There's nothing sacred about taking youngsters miles into the wilderness environment because the environment is right outside your door, and that's a great place to begin. We start in the classroom. Here, a group of students are kneeling on the floor with a bunch of yarn. What are they doing? 
They're measuring this dinosaur. How big this dinosaur really was and must have been, because history is a part of environmental education as well. And we go to our zoo and we utilize it. But we don't, repeat, don't go to the zoo. I'm on the zoo's board of directors. We learned in a very careful survey that the average amount of time that a person stays in front of a zoo exhibit is nine seconds. Now that's not enough time to do more than find out if the animal is there. You can't even read the sign. And then off to the next. Why? Because you're gonna see the zoo. I'll bet a dollar when you go to a museum you do the same thing. How much of the museum can you see? So we're working on educational ventures with teachers to see a set of animals in the zoo. So they go and examine the hoof stock, not the zoo. They go and examine the nocturnal animals, not the zoo. Or the botanical gardens at the zoo. We use our high school people uh, very greatly with our young children. This is an example of a program that is working in many schools that called the Each One Teach One. When you're taking a group of young children into some place, your supervision can be a as a bigger headache than the education that you're trying to handle and so each one teach one is a very good experience and we have a lot of high school people who have been turned on to doing this because somebody did it for them a few years ago. Now this is a dark picture not surprisingly it's inside a planetarium and so students may go to the planetarium as a part of environmental education as well. You can see by now that our definition of the environment and outdoor education is not synonymous with wilderness environmental education. We're talking about the whole concept of environment. Further, because when I walk into some schools and say outdoor education, half of the staff get up and walk out because they say, that's not for me. I'm the vocational education teacher. I'm the dramatics teacher. I'm the music teacher. We've decided to call it off-campus education and we're getting more and more programs in our schools where Six teachers sit down together and plan a program, and one of those is the music teacher and the drama teacher helping to do things in environmental education, and it becomes a team concept. We take them to historic sites like our Heritage Park, where the youngsters are amazed to find that in this building, for example, are square nails that were beaten by a blacksmith rather than cast out of steel, where they can do all kinds of interesting studies that lead up to certain dimensions of environmental education or historic buildings about the religious connotations of the country. How can you study in Alberta, near Calgary, something of the environment unless you recognize that communities like those occupied by the Mennonites and the Hutterites have to be considered because their lifestyle is different from yours, but it must be considered. We take them to Banff, for example, to the Tussaud Waxworks, or we take them on a tour of the lake where they can uh, travel. Now, I'm going to borrow this chair because you're having a heck of a time seeing over me. Where they have an opportunity to get a good close look at the study of a lake with the animals that live about the lake, the significance of pollution within the lake, and experiences of that order. We consider this to be very important. There are certain sterile things within the classroom that you cannot teach. So you must take them to where the action is. We have within our city and elsewhere in the province, provincial parks. And we've gone out overtly to the provincial parks people and said, look, we want a stake in your planning. We are the educational system. Our four, five, and six-year-olds of today are the clients that are going to be going through your park tomorrow and they're going to be the ones that are voting. So let's get things in perspective, shall we? And we have educational programs at this provincial park that would boggle your mind, where they visit the historic buildings and the offices and are welcome there, where they have built classroom space for it, where we can see inside the historic buildings of Pat Burns, who was one of the pioneers of the province where we can walk in the Wilderness Park and all along the Fish Creek and see firsthand examples of pollution and other things of that order. We've concluded an agreement with the Forestry Department and they have given us the exclusive use of five of their group camps. And in each group camp, and we, we put together programs so that if a teacher has never been to the group camp, we can send them a whole slide presentation and a set of lessons as to what they will find there. I don't mean fancy lessons, I mean this is the road you take and that's where you turn so you don't get lost kind of information. 
and what you'll, what you'll find when you're there. And what's good about this? Doesn't cost you a dime. We use such camps as Pine Grove, River Cove, and three others. The facilities are, in some ways, uh, rather spartan for some groups. This building is not a residence, it's simply a place where there's a, a big fireplace, but it's a place where you can go to get warm if you must get warm. Uh, we have them scaled. River Cove is close to a forestry station so that if a youngster or a group of teachers or anybody gets into trouble, there's an escape mechanism. Because you have to have that kind of security or parents are going to laugh you right out of the building when you start talking about it. You can't see this, and I'm sorry, but it is, and I'll show it to other people some other time if they want, a teepee, because we go to the Stony Indian Wilderness Camp, and we've had groups of students live in teepees for as long as 20 days and replicate the way of life as it was when the Indians were there. We use facilities uh, like the Canadian Youth Hostels. I bought 30 memberships to the Canadian Youth Hostel Association and convinced them that these memberships should be transferable. So now if a school wants to go and use a hostel, they can get a membership from me and use it and they don't have to go out and buy it themselves. Why do we do these things? Well, we want to get youngsters out, away, into the different world, take a new stock on life. Not only from the educational standpoint, but you're going to find to your horror that youngsters are going to be failing in your classroom because the classroom is not where they're going to shine. So why not see if they can shine in a totally different kind of classroom? One like the one you're seeing on the screen. We take youngsters on exchange trips to Vancouver. Here's a teacher with a group of youngsters that went all the way to Vancouver, lived with students who lived in Vancouver, and then the Vancouver kids came back to Calgary and lived with us. Total cost to my daughter who took part for a total of 10 days of experience was $30. They went aboard a Chinese communist ship and saw Canadian grain being shipped elsewhere. And that's part of environmental education because you know you've got to tie it to the economy. And who do we teach? Everybody we can. From kindergarten kids on snowshoes, to intermediate kids who are simply having a chance to see if they can drag the teachers into the mud, to teachers themselves learning to do their thing and change their thinking so they can agree and talk to the students that we're, we're educating. And that's so dark, I can't tell you what it is. Type of studies? All right, here are some. Having some faith in your classmate. Here's a kid with a blindfold on. And simply by the voice of another child, he's working his way through a forested area. That teaches you confidence in your fellow man. In this situation, the youngster is studying a tree, blindfolded. He's touching it, feeling it, licking it, tasting it, rubbing against it. Why? Because we're going to take him 50 meters away, take his blindfold off, and then have him go and find his tree. Snow crystals. The snowflake that you see on your windshield or that muck on the streets doesn't always look that way. It's a thing of beauty. Ever live in a squingy? We had 25 girls live in ice houses that they made themselves. This Cree, this Cree uh, type of activity called a squingy, where you mix up snow, use a scientific principle to watch the snow harden, hollow up the inside, and then live in it for five days. We want to give the youngsters as many options. I'd much rather see the question said, who lives here? And watch the kids struggle to find out. What made this? Now, we have an outdoor school where our main thrust is. Uh, this is where the biggest number of dollars go, because annually we take 2,000 people to an outdoor school that starts in January and finishes in June. Every student involved goes out on a Monday morning and is not heard from again till Monday night. At least that's what the parents, or Friday night, that's what the parents think. But we have to keep the parents informed because they're not going to let you do these things and they're satisfied that what you're doing is educationally worthwhile and safe. And if it doesn't meet those criteria, forget it. We have an outdoor school. We have in this nine...
On the way, they stop at a town perhaps nearby. It happens to be the town of Cochrane and asks the question, why is this town here? What is, is it, what is its excuse for being within this environment? What has it done to the river? What is it like to live so close to a sprawling giant of nearly a half a million people? They stop at certain buildings that are no longer in use and ask the question, why are they not? Is it because the land has ceased to support the people who once lived upon it? Or is it a part of another environmental phenomenon, the gravitation toward the urban center? When we get them to our outdoor school, the, for young children, the environment has to be fairly comfortable. If they're not comfortable, they're not interested. They're too busy thinking about how uncomfortable they are. Leave that to the teachers, they do it all the time. Inside every building, the parents are glad to know it's warm, it's comfortable, and there's a smoke detector and a fire alarm. Because it's a school still, you see. It's not a recreational activity, it's not a dude ranch, it's still a school. The youngsters go out winter and summer. But what a place to teach the concepts of geology of the slough and the people and the animals that live near it. Of the microscopy that you can do to let your own senses be expanded by a device that lets you see more, better, and clearly. Record your findings. What about the youngster who's not terribly athletic but sure likes art? Orienteering and map work in groups. Sorry, but this is astronomy. But you know, when you go in some of the centers that where I am, the smog is so terrible that if you put your telescope up in your backyard, you get a beautiful view of something brown. How to study a tree without destroying the tree? You use an increment bore and drive into the trunk and then plug it up afterwards and everything is fine. You don't have to cut it down. Outdoor cooking. Sounds like fun, it's really good. But we had one year of experience with a group of schools that went out and they, they were lazy. They, they built a fire pit, fine, but they never cleaned it out. So the next group, instead of cleaning out that fire pit and using it, made another fire pit. And so it went until we had about 20 fire pits. It made an interesting lesson to them when they discovered that each fire pit sterilized the soil for about 10 feet in every direction and made it impossible to grow. We have kids who go out in the winter time. <clears throat> Although I'm sure most of the teachers would rather have it in the summertime. We provide equipment for the youngsters who can't otherwise go. Suppose you have a class of 30 people and 20, uh, to only 25 of them have sleeping bags, backpack frames and whatever. Do you leave the other five at home? Not in our system. Our board says it's important. If it is important, it's important for everybody. So that youngster comes to where I am, goes to my loan pool, and we will lend him the necessary material to make it go. The ranchers in the community have been enlisted as cooperators, and they let the youngsters do studies on their property. We don't always do much in, in riding, but I heard uh, particularly Mr. O'Keefe mention the automobile. If we're not forced into not using it, uh, it won't be long before maybe we'll return <laughs> to the West with that same old Indian and riding a horse. <laughs> the youngsters learn to study in large groups. But we feel you've got to give the youngster time to be alone. And you seldom do that in your schools. At the end, how do you know you've done a good thing? Well, if you've got the courage that is necessary to make you survive in this world, you take a chance and you go to the parents and you say, all right, we told you we were going to do this. We did this. What do you think of it? And we issue an evaluation to the, te the, the parents of the students who participated in our program. We've been lucky so far. 97.6% support. Yes. At a time, in this particular project, in that particular outdoor school, we have 100 people at a crack. The reason that we don't have more is, A, I would never have more on that particular site. It becomes an educational factory, and you don't have an opportunity for the kind of interface and family studies that should be going on. We would get another site if we possibly could. Yes? 
Pardon? The regular classroom teachers are forced to go along with the boys and girls. That's their position of commitment. And in addition to that, I have a professional staff of four who act in a kind of a consulting support and related teaching capacity. I'm going to say that I, I, I shouldn't be taking as much time as I am. I will now continue and use both lips so it goes faster. And then with the permission or the uh, willingness of anybody, if I get through the rest of this boring presentation, if you have questions and want some answers and are willing to stay, I'll stay as long as you want. Is that fair enough? But I know some people have dinner engagements coming up. This is a teachable moment. You can't see it. You wouldn't even be able to see it, perhaps, if the picture was even clearer, because right in the middle of it is a partridge. And that's part of environmental study. What a chance to catch an animal on the move, the teachable moment. You'll never find that in the classroom. But we want to also do something different with youngsters, and that is give them a feeling of senses of a different order. Everybody knows about the senses of sight and touch. I'm not interested in those. They're givens with most of us. Instead, we hope that our outdoor education programs, some of them, will change attitudes within youngsters so that they're more amenable to do the things that are the right things and will capitalize better on all those things in the community that are going to make their life a better thing. But you've got to change the attitudes or give an environment in here that is open enough for the youngster to think of something other than a certain set of limited parameters. So our senses that we're talking about are a sense of wonder, a sense of the beauty that you can find in the most unlikely place that is matchless because only nature is the master painter. A sense of place, how big you are, how small it is. And a bug, you know, is not something to be screamed at and skirts raised and a rush away. Why do youngsters pick up <coughs> a bug and go, ooh? Not naturally. Somebody showed them how to do it. A sense of time. This tree once stood proud and tall. Before that, it was a sea. It now no longer stands proud and tall, but it's returning to the soil the timeless majesty of nature and how it handles things, and it'll handle you if you don't learn to live with it. A sense of, of belonging, a sense of yourself. And kids react positively to this we have found. This little girl didn't know that she was being photographed. I'd have given a lot of money to find out what was going on inside her head. Finally, just a sense of being very happy with being alive. We think that our environmental and outdoor education and off-campus program is directed in a way that we think we can live with. I'm not here to suggest to you that Calgary is a wonderful and exciting place and we have everything we want in great copious amounts and we have found the answer to everything because that would be an outrageous lie. This is what we are doing. This is the direction we think we would like to pursue. We think we're on the right track, and with luck, somebody will tell us when we're not. I'm sorry I've taken so much of your time this morning. I hope that you didn't find it a total waste, and I will be glad to entertain or answer questions should you have any. Thank you very much. I'm sure that, that all of us can be grateful in, a, in having this opportunity to envision the diversity of environmental education. Thanks again, Mr. Hogan. Thank you, sir. Yes, Ellen? The board has put a budget aside, of course, because you can't hire teachers without paying their salaries and these new costs. 
It is also partly supported by the parents of the youngsters who take part because very few school systems have contracted to feed children. But we have a policy and the board has insisted on it and the policy says, no child shall be denied the right to take part in any outdoor education activity simply on the basis of inability to pay. So when I go out and I'm selecting schools for this particular activity and I speak to every single parent's group, in other words, when I start that school, I'm committed to 40 speaking engagements right off the bat. I say to every parent group, if there's any trouble that any of you have being able to afford this, just tell the principal and the child will go anyway because the board has said no child will not go simply because they can't afford. In our, if they don't have the right school or clothing or something like that, I have a clothing bank. Uh, I have equipment uh, so that a child I guess what I'm really trying to say is I want to make it as easy for the teacher and for the child as I possibly can. And I think this is what our board is feeling. But how did you, con who convinced the board that it was... Oh, we played the game, Ellen. We played the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's a game that if you haven't, if, it's a game that if you haven't played it yet, you will. It's called politics. It's called knocking on doors. It's called doing it off times when you're doing it on a shirt tail measure and getting people who agree with you to say so until finally you get a significant group of parents or some other who will say, that was a good thing, let's do it again. If you think you can go by yourself, you can. You're a lone voice crying in the wilderness. It has taken us over 10 years to get to where we are. But, me, I'm sorry, yes? Uh, I was wondering, before everybody was leaving, I was wondering, I have a few announcements, urgent announcements to make that were added to me with regard to scheduling, so I, I'm sorry for interrupting. That's you. all right. Um, James McKenzie, who is scheduled to speak at 1 o'clock, his flight was delayed or, or canceled. But he will be here, and he will speak after Richard Passmore at 4.45 here. One other, <clears throat> several other announcements. There will be an out outward bound presentation in the cafeteria tonight at 6.30, and the film is at 7. There's also a change of location at 2 o'clock. Dr. Schmidt will be speaking in room 213 rather than the cafeteria. And the Valor resource will be in the cafeteria rather than room 213. Let me repeat that again. At 2 o'clock, Dr. Schmidt will be speaking in room 213 rather than the cafeteria. The Valley resource will be in the cafeteria rather than room 213. I'm sorry for interrupting. If you want to continue, with questions to Mr. Halton or Mr. O'Keefe. I'm sure they'll be glad to receive it. I know that you want to get away and I don't feel bad. I'll finish the answer. Uh, sometimes people are a little bit daffy. Uh, the first time you go and you ask and you struggle, you will get knocked down. Uh, as I was talking to Bob and a few other friends of mine here, you have to be crazy to get up. Somebody smart would stay down, but you'll probably keep getting up. And if you get up often enough, they'll get awful tired of seeing you, and maybe you'll win. It's a long process. For everything that you saw and all the program support and all the work that's done, including my salary, the salary of my assistant and my secretary, the budget was in the order for our system of $147,000, which sounds like a lot. Oh, I have a foggy side. I'm a very little frog in a very large frog. Not to the same degree. Well, we have the happy faculty of being the largest system in the province, and uh, very often, if you get desperate enough, you just say, all right, to hell with you, and you go ahead anyhow. Only through the conventional means. There are no special grants. Are there aspects of how 
it is always voluntary because schools have to set their own priorities. I'm in every school. You could, you see, if I say I have 220,000 Good afternoon. Before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to make an announcement. The Valhalla Committee slideshow, which was shown this afternoon, will be repeated again tomorrow, and that will be at 12 noon in the theater building. So if you'd like to make a note of that. Now, the person I'm going to introduce is Mr. Dick Passmore. He is the former executive director of the Canadian Wildlife Federation. He is an environmental consultant. He is active in outdoor education and the environment with regard to teacher training. He is the co-author, along with NDU's Bob Harrington, of Learning About Environment. And he also has another book in print, and that is entitled Environmental Problems. Mr. Passmore's training is as a forester and a biologist. He will be speaking to us this afternoon on the environmental impact of development in the far north of Canada. So I give you Mr. Dick Passmore. Thank you, Kim. Ladies and gentlemen, I must uh, tell you to begin with that I spent yesterday pretty much immobilized by a flu bug. Uh, most of me has recovered sufficiently that I can be here, except my voice. So I'm going to have to uh, depend on you to tell me when I'm either too close to this thing or, or too far away, uh, because I would like you to, to hear me. Um, the subject is the environmental impact of development in the far north. And that combination of words, far north, always bothers me a little bit. At uh, one time in my career as a biologist, I had some responsibilities for fish and wildlife in what seems like a pretty northern part of Ontario. Uh, situated in Cochrane, Ontario, which is here, and the uh, responsibilities that went up along the west side of James Bay and Hudson's Bay into uh, subarctic and some actual Arctic uh, biological conditions there. But in the uh, in its wisdom, my organization transferred me southward, some 500 miles, down close to the north shore of Lake Ontario. And soon after I arrived there, I, uh, in the course of my duties, it attended a tourist outfitters meeting where one gentleman spoke at some length and quite eloquently about the need to, quote, preserve our Northlands. And that had me a little confused. I had just come from an area that seemed to be almost in the north. And I'd come south, and now someone was talking about the Northlands, and I wondered really what part of Canada he was speaking of. It turned out that it was anything that grew forest uh, north of Highway 7, which is 30 miles north of Lake Ontario. So I guess far north and how far north depend on your experience and your perspective. So uh, perhaps we'd better define it. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about uh, development in the Yukon and Northwest Territories which begin, have their southern boundary, where the provinces leave off at the 60th parallel of latitude, and they go north from there forever. And they really do, because um, when you stand on the shore of the Beaufort Sea here, the Arctic Ocean, and look northward, you realize you're still not north. Uh, there's lots of land and lots of permanent ice pack there to the north of you, 
and to really feel that you've been in the north, you really should go farther and explore some of that. Uh, specifically, um, we'll be dealing with the more northerly part of the landmass, uh, the continental landmass of the territories, and to a lesser degree with the Arctic archipelago. But when we talk about development in the far north, we're inclined to think of it as recent, and I would like to remind you that earlier in this decade, the Hudson's Bay Company celebrated its 300th anniversary. It claims to be the oldest incorporated company in the world. When it was incorporated, it was given the quaint name of the Company of Gentlemen Trading into Hudson's Bay, now commonly known as the Bay, of course. But it has remained the same company through all that period and has been active throughout the Canadian North during 300 and some years. I'm not sure whether it's worth it, especially in uh, terms of the time it would take to go into what influence the Hudson's Bay Company and its trading in the North may have had on native people and on the environment there. I think perhaps the whalers who came along a little later in the 18th and 19th centuries had a greater impact, environmentally at least, not only did they uh, quite drastically deplete some of the stocks of whales that they sought, but many of them would be caught in the ice in overwinter or realize it was too late to get out and they would seek the best ports for overwintering. Now, there were a few of these scattered around the north, and one that I have visited and am more or less familiar with is Herschel Island, which lies close to the uh, shore of the northern Yukon. And it is significant in that it is a natural deep water harbor, which occurs in an otherwise rather shallow shoreline area where uh, overwintering for a seagoing ship would be rather difficult. So for many years, it was customary for a number of whaling boats to tie up at Herschel Island over winter. And uh, in order to have fresh meat, they would get the local natives to hunt caribou, muskox, dull sheep, and so forth. The muskoxen of the area were totally extirpated uh, by overuse by the overwintering whalers. The caribou depleted considerably, and all of the local populations of dull sheep were extirpated. So the whalers even though they themselves didn't go inland, uh, did have an impact on uh, the north. And the story was the same in the other vicinities where overwintering was at all customary. I suppose the next round of development in the north is something that took place on the more modern scale. It involved transportation, machinery, earth-moving, construction. And that was the building of the Dew Line. One normally expects members of his audience to be thoroughly familiar with the Dew Line, but when I look at some of, of the young faces before me, you may not recall, personally at least, the building of the Dew Line in the early 1950s. DEW stands for Distant Early Warning. This was the chain of radar stations across the far north that was to warn us of what was thought to be an imminent attack from the north, Russian obviously, uh, by the means of, of delivery of bombs in those days, which was uh, uh, ordinary aircraft. So the Dew Line was constructed with great haste and manned mostly by Americans. And of course, it wasn't long until it became almost totally obsolete. Uh, 
with the development of long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, the the dew line was the first real encounter in the north with northern conditions by southern construction people and developers. And they found out for the first time, for instance, what it was like to try and construct something on permafrost. They built airstrips and buildings uh, and wondered uh, you know, why it wasn't like building an airstrip in southern Canada. Well, the dew line never was called upon to give its early warning of any kind of invasion. But it really should have provided an early warning to developers about the kinds of prob problems they would encounter, I'm sorry, uh, in any further development of the North. It's not true to say that they learned nothing by this experience because some research was started about how to construct buildings and have them remain stable on a permafrost base. Uh, and some of that work was quite good. But when the oil developers went back in in the late 60s and early 70s, they still built airstrips the same way and had them uh, useful for one year only and then uh, had them uh, frost heave and slump and otherwise become unus unusable. So they didn't learn very much. Perhaps the real start of modern development in the far north starts with elections that some of you may remember in 1957 and 1958 when the Conservatives were coming to power under John Diefenbaker. His great slogan that he spoke of often was his vision of the North, the North to be developed, to become a more important part of Canada, to uh, develop the last frontier. And he did make it happen. Uh, the government got uh, some of the government branches like the Geological Survey of Canada very active throughout the North. And it wasn't long until in the early 60s there were new maps coming out at a good rate showing much more about the geology and mineralogy of the North. And this encouraged a great lot of exploration for minerals and for uh, petroleum products. Some of the uh, mineral finds were uh, worth developing. Nobody initially found anything terribly promising about the with the petroleum exploration. I think it was about 1968 that the government was quite concerned about the slow pace of uh, the increase in petroleum exploration in the north and uh, formed uh, essentially their own company. Um, what, what's it called? The um, Yeah, Pan-Arctic. <laughs> it's a combination of government and industry uh, uh, working together as a consortium to uh, explore for uh, petroleum resources in the far north. They had difficulty getting that company formed because they really couldn't stir much interest. Until in 1969, at Prudhoe Bay in Alaska, which is just along the coast from the Alaska-Yukon boundary, just over and about that area, a rich strike of oil was made, uh, I suppose, uh, essentially by um, ARCO. And this was followed in January of 1970 by a strike of oil at Atkinson Point on the Tuktoyaktuk Peninsula just uh, east of the Mackenzie Delta. That's the Tuck Peninsula that sticks out into the Beaufort Sea a little way there. And of course, what had been very uh, low interest in petroleum exploration in the north uh, became a land rush for uh, 
tying up uh, permit exploration areas and getting on with the job of doing the seismic and other exploratory work necessary to demonstrate whether or not you had made a good choice in, in um, uh, tying up permit areas. But the kind of technology that these people took to the north with them was the same technology that had been used in te Texas and Oklahoma to find and develop oil and gas fields there. It had been used successfully enough, but I think rather destructively in many cases in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even in northeastern BC. And it was just transferred, holus bolus, all this experience of how to take D7 bulldozers and run lines for collecting seismic information, uh, how to drag a massive hundreds of tons drilling rig across the countryside and set it in place to do your test drilling. All of this was transplanted with virtually no modification into a completely different set of circumstances much more different than those who were doing the exploration realized. Because in the, in the first place, you had permafrost to encounter. Maybe we better stop and talk a little bit about what permafrost is. Theoretically, at least, anywhere where the mean annual temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, you get a permanently frozen condition of at least the upper layers of the soil. I don't mean right to the surface, but uh, subsurface down to some depth below that. Uh, depending upon temperature, primarily, also the kind of insulation which surface vegetation and uh, surface materials offer. Uh, this permafrost may go quite deep. Um, I know of depths of at least 1,800 feet and they may way well exceed 2,000 feet of permafrost in some localities. The southern uh, fringe of the quote permanently unquote frozen ground has been extending southward through the past couple of decades because of a uh, cooling trend in climate and it now lies um, somewhere in this vicinity. And south of that there is discontinuous permafrost. That is, some parts of the land are frozen uh, and remain frozen through the summer. Others freeze and thaw annually, just as our surface soils do here. Now, permafrost does some funny things. Um, you have to remember a little bit of physics about some of the forces that accompany the freezing of water and uh, um, especially uh, think back to the frost heaves that you can encounter on the roads not too far away, because I found some today, <laughs> uh, that occur at this time of the year. They come about by a process of, of water molecules virtually being drawn to a freezing front. It's more complicated than that, but if you think of it as water being drawn to a freeze front, uh, you end up with the, in the right ballpark. So that when the north froze, and heaven knows when that was, or heaven knows how many times it has frozen and thawed, how many times it has been above and below the sea, the um, <clears throat> Uh, geology of the Mackenzie Delta area in particular and some of the areas like the Tuck Peninsula are very difficult to figure out um, and I don't say that on my say-so but on the say-so of people who are much more qualified than I and have made a study of it and have come up a little bit empty-handed. 
uh, it's a very complex uh, area geologically because of these beams of coal that were hit on the way down. So heaven knows how old it is, uh, but it's been permanently frozen for a very long time and looks perfectly fresh. It's a complicated thing. But apparently much of the land was well watered at the time it froze. And this moisture tended to accumulate so that you get massive ice lenses somewhere under the soil. I recall seeing a place on the uh, northern Yukon coast where the Beaufort Sea had gradually eaten its way into the shoreline and just exposed the edge of one of these tremendous big ice lenses. So that over the years, an area that would be perhaps 15 acres in extent had, had just dropped, slumped um, a depth of perhaps 20 or 30 feet as the ice melted out from under it. So when you disturb the soil or the vegetation growing on the soil over perm permafrost, you don't quite know what you're uh, going to find underneath. There are, for instance, pingos in the, particularly on the Tuck Peninsula, in the vicinity of the Mackenzie Delta, and there are even some out under the sea, under the Beaufort Sea. Now, a pingo forms from an old lake uh, being drained by normal geological processes, but leaving a very wet base. Because the lake was deep enough before it drained that the frost never did get to the bottom of the lake each year. There was always some water under the ice. There would not be permafrost below the lake. And um, so you have, uh, perhaps I better The old lake basin with permafrost coming up to the edges of it to where the water must have been six or eight feet deep and then below the lake uh, freedom from permafrost. But once the lake drained and no longer insulated it from the uh, cold, the permafrost does take over. And the moisture that is in the lake basin is drawn by this frost action into a cone so that you end up with something that looks like this. And uh, perma permafrost would now extend, uh, would be continuous underneath it, but there is a, a um, mat of some soil and vegetation over the pingo that prevents it from thawing. Unless, as in one case I saw, where some uh, happy bulldozer operator had taken his machine up to the top of one and leveled the top off, just so he could have a good look around the countryside. Perhaps he was lost, but one ruined pingo. Well, these pingos are obviously pretty outstanding geological features. Uh, oh, they'd be some of them a quarter of a mile or more across at the base and six, seven hundred feet high. So they're, they're not small, although some of them are, but the larger ones are certainly, you know, quite um, impressive. At the, at the base of the Tuck Peninsula, there is quite a pingo field. There are, pingos are quite numerous and varied and for some years now there has been talk of creating a pingo national park in the vicinity of Tuk Tuk. But in 1965 this newly transplanted technology of oil exploration was transplanted to that area 
by Imperial Oil, as it turned out, although I think perhaps any of the other companies might have done the same. And they still thought they could walk bulldozers over this tundra underlain by permafrost in the summertime, only to make their geophones of the seismic equipment more, um, put them in more firm contact with the ground, they bulldozed the surface soil away and set them right on the permafrost. Of course, <coughs> they encountered uh, massive ice and ice-rich soils, which meant that these bulldozed lines are now channels up to six, seven feet deep uh, where the ice melted out of them. And they have made the area quite unsightly. I think it's unlikely that there will ever be a Pingo National Park in that area because of these, this crisscrossing of channels or moats or whatever you might care to call them now. And this was just one of the early impacts of technology. I would suggest to you that if an oil field had been discovered as a result of that bulldozing and seismic, that it might have afforded some employment to the natives of Tuktoyotuk for 20 years or at a maximum, say, 50. A national park would have afforded employment and an economic base forever but they weren't really given a choice as to which it would be. There has, of course, been gas and oil uh, discovered in the vicinity of the Mackenzie Delta and the Tuck Peninsula, and of course, on some of the high Arctic islands. Unfortunately, when uh, Panarctic made its first discovery at Great at Drake Point, uh, that well blew on them uh, because it was insufficiently uh, protected with the right protective devices for keeping the pressure under control. And uh, they had to work pretty hard to drill uh, another well to intersect the first one and close it off. Most of that work was done in the summer. Uh, I have seen aerial photographs of the tracks that the bulldozers and other equipment left there. I uh, think in, uh, in terms of the foreseeable future, those tracks will be there forever because uh, they have intercepted permafrost near the surface. And furthermore, the vegetation in uh, northern ecosystems grows so very slowly. The incident energy from the sun is you know, quite low in the first place. It occurs over a very short period of the year at temperatures that are not very high, and it isn't very much power to drive an ecosystem very fast. The energy transfer within the system is very slow. Growth of all kinds is very slow. A willow plant that you encounter two or three feet high may be the product of decades of growth. And even in the Mackenzie Delta, where uh, it's about the northern extremity for black spruce, a three-inch tree may be 300 years old. That's how slow the growth is. That's how slow the land recovers from this kind of disturbance. And of course, like the bulldozed seismic lines, the disturbance doesn't stop with the vegetation. Man's action on the permafrost becomes actually a geological force. From the exploration and finding small amounts of both gas and oil, there has, of course, been uh, talk of pipelines to carry these materials southward. The first was for an oil pipeline, and some test facilities were set up at Inuvik in the Mackenzie Delta, over there, <coughs> to uh, test the concept of moving warm oil, because you must understand that, well, depending upon uh, how deep you draw it from and under what pressure it's been sitting, oil uh, comes to the surface quite warm, something in the order of, say, 140 to perhaps 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And then, of course, in order to 
pump it, you use energy. And the energy uh, doesn't dissipate altogether. Most of it ends up as waste heat that goes into the oil so that you keep reheating it each time you pump it to move it in the pipeline. So the pipeline is quite warm. And there were various experiments about insulating it so that it wouldn't melt the permafrost and burying it in different kinds of configurations uh, with different kinds of gravel and so forth around it. But really, all that they learned is that while you can slow the rate of heat transfer with insulation, you cannot stop it. And uh, despite whatever you do, you the line, the hot line, melts the permafrost that surrounds it within a decade or so. So the design parameters for the hot oil pipeline were to allow melting of up to melting that would permit the line to drop up to three feet. Anything more than that, they were worried about the integrity of the line, the, the stresses that might be placed on it that would cause it to break and uh, have an oil spill. Where those criteria could not be met, then the oil pipeline would be elevated and put above uh, particularly ice-rich or, su or uh, areas susceptible to melting. That oil pipeline didn't go, of course. Uh, it was to include tra transport of oil from the Prudhoe Bay field. Well, the decision was that the oil would be transported across Alaska and transshipped from Valdez to some more southerly port. So that oil pipeline wasn't built. But there is even now discussion of how uh, oil from the Mackenzie Delta, provided enough is ever found to warrant it, how it would be transported southward in Canada. And the same sorts of considerations are are going on. Gas pipelines have been in the news, I think, a good deal more currently and recently. And there has been one major proposal that has received a lot of attention. That's the proposal of the Canadian Arctic Gas Pipeline Limited, or CAGPO. Theirs is a proposal to build a 48-inch line from Prudhoe Bay preferably for them from Prudhoe Bay eastward, close to the coast, um, but on land, to uh, the Mackenzie Delta, and then southward, or in a generally southerly direction, up the Mackenzie Valley. This would then also take care of transporting any oil that occurs, or I'm sorry, any gas that occurs in the Mackenzie Delta area, and there has, there are some proven gas finds there, but uh, I understand not sufficient supplies to warrant construction of a pipeline on their own. I think one other thing one can see about such a, a pipeline covering both major supply sources is that whoever builds it has a monopoly on transportation of oil and gas from that area. There have been, as you know, the Berger hearings in Yellowknife uh, related to the environmental and social impacts of constructing such a pipeline. And I've been privileged to uh, participate in those hearings to some extent and uh, certainly to have some contact with the kinds of information that were uh, heard there. And frankly, the, the potential for environmental impact, those potentials are really appalling. There should simply never be permission given to bring a gas pipeline across the northern Yukon, for instance, on that shallowly sloping um, area that goes down to the Beaufort Sea. Inland, oh, 50 to 100 miles from the shore are the British mountains. 
and their foothills slope very gradually down to the uh, Beaufort Sea. And it would be along that slope at a distance maybe 20 or 30 miles from the Beaufort Sea that most of the pipeline would be built. It's presently a pretty remote wild area, heavily used by wildlife. It is the calving and summering ground for a large segment of the porcupine caribou herd, which numbers, it depends whose estimate you're using, but it's something over 100,000 and probably less than 170,000. It's a lot of caribou. It's also the late summer staging area for most of Western North America's snow geese that hatch in various locations in the Arctic, but then move partway south and fatten for their migration on the lush sedges primarily that grow on the uh, Yukon Flats. Um, one hates to think of the kind of disturbance that the construction and monitoring and repair and maintenance of even one pipeline would do to that area. And there's a, a question, of course, as to whether it's going to be just one pipeline or whether it may end up being a few pipelines and uh, perhaps an all-weather road that would uh, accompany uh, a pipeline for ease of maintenance and repair. You see, at Prudhoe Bay, they the Alaskans claim they have something like 114 trillion cubic feet of natural gas along with, I think it's 19 point some billion barrels of, of oil. Well, a 48 inch oil pipeline will take out um, well, about 14 billion barrels in 20 years. But a 48 inch pipeline for natural gas will take out only 30 odd trillion cubic feet in 20 years. So if you're going to bring all of Prudhoe Bay's natural gas out in one pipeline, you're going to do it over between 60 and 70 years. Now we've had enough in the news in the last few weeks about natural gas shortages in the United States that you know that they're going to bring it out in that shorter period, not the longer one. So it's not going to be just one pipeline. It's going to be two or three. So now you've got really a whole corridor which is going to develop across a very critical wildlife range if that pipeline ever goes that route. Personally, I'm convinced that the Berger Commission hearings have shed enough light on the kinds of damage that would be done that permission will never be granted to build the pipeline along that route nor perhaps on the interior route which follows the Porcupine River uh, down up about there. The Porcupine is a tributary of the big Yukon River. The Porcupine is a river in which um, salmon come all the way from the Pacific Ocean and that's something like 2,000 miles away for on a spawning migration. There is the community of Old Crow on the banks of the Porcupine River. Uh, one of the few communities of native people, unfortunately, that is still pretty, pretty largely self-reliant, uh, still pretty largely living off the land. Uh, five years ago, one might have said that they were entirely self-sufficient, but since oil exploration has moved close by, I don't think that is the case anymore. Uh, the community of Old Crow has caught the sympathy of many, many Canadians uh, to see their way of life disrupted as it would be by first the construction phase and then the operation phase of even one pipeline, line, let alone several pipelines. Uh, I don't think it would be 
easy to get permission for them to build a line through the interior route. But of course, there are better routes and corridors anyway, and the only trouble with them is that they don't give to any one consortium a monopoly on transporting gas in the Arctic. There is already across Alaska the corridor which has been developed for construction of the oil pipeline from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez. And this comes close to Fairbanks, and of course Fairbanks is the terminus of the, the Alaska Highway. One can take, uh, take off from the Prudhoe Bay to Valdez pipeline corridor in the vicinity of Big Bend, which is this side of, of Fairbanks, and parallel the Alaska Highway through an area in which the environmental damage by one pipeline or a number of pipelines would be very much lower than uh, would be the case in uh, of going across the northern Yukon, either on the coastal route or the Porcupine River route. There is, before the Energy Board now, the National Energy Board here in Canada, an application to construct a pipeline along that route, and one only hopes that environmentalists will keep enough pressure on them to ensure that that would receive preference over an environmentally very damaging pipeline across the northern Yukon. A gas pipeline does rather funny things to permafrost and to non-permafrost areas. In the first place, the gas is at very high pressure. I guess something like about 800 atmospheres. Almost enough pressure to liquefy it, but not quite. Um, it is transported chilled through permafrost areas so as not to melt the permafrost when you bury the pipe. Now, gas flows along a pressure gradient from high pressure to low, so you have to keep repressurizing it by massive big uh, pumping equipment every 50 miles or thereabouts. And these are big things. Uh, I'm not quite sure what motors they plan to use now on the Kagpole line, but at one time they were considering an, a jet engine almost identical to that being used on the 747 jetliner. So these are uh, big masses of energy they put back into the, the gas to repressurize it, which has the unfortunate disadvantage of reheating it, so they have to chill it again and put it back into the line. And they're going to chill it down to something like, uh, certainly it's going to be below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, probably around 20 degrees. But then, since it's flowing along a pressure gradient, the, the pressure reduces as the gas gets farther away from the uh, compressor station. As it expands, it cools. So that by the time it gets to the next, uh, compressor station is down to about zero degrees Fahrenheit, or in that order of temperature. And <clears throat> in unfrozen soils, it gradually builds up a frost bulb around the, the um, gas pipeline. It's estimated that in about 10 years, the frost bulb would extend perhaps 30, 30 feet down from the surface. Now you can imagine what this does to any subsurface, surface, or near surface drainage in an area. What you've done is uh, you've created a, a tremendous bulb around the pipe, extending virtually from the surface down to perhaps 30 feet, and you've sealed off with a wall of ice any movement of moisture. You'd, you would start a whole new set of drainage patterns, is what it amounts to, in the north. And with all of the cutting and siltation 
uh, destruction of spawning beds and so forth that this would, would cause. And of course, anywhere where you disturb permafrost to lay a pipeline, particularly at river crossings, you open the way, especially along the, uh, a steep-sided valley, uh, to uh, melting of permafrost because you've disturbed the insulation that overlies the permafrost. And uh, this would lead to um, <coughs> a flow of newly melted material down the valley walls and into the stream at the bottom. Or in a shallow stream, you close, close off uh, the uh, subsurface flow by this frost bulb that is created. So the implications for environmental damage from a poorly placed pipeline are really quite tremendous. These are the things that the Berger Commission has heard and within a month or so um, there should be some uh, recommendations going uh, to the government from the final phases of the Berger Commission. trying to hurry through some of this material to give you a little opportunity at the end to ask questions about things that I may have left unclear or to have some input of your own to uh, uh, the discussion. I think the whole uh, picture of recent northern development and the recent interest in transporting petroleum products from the north to the south has real inf implications for environmental education. Uh, certainly, it's quite evident that neither the corporations nor the governments, nor for that matter, uh, the nation have known or cared enough about the environmental impacts of recent development in the North, or about the kinds of ecological constraints there are in working in that type of, of environment with its very slow rates of growth and its permafrost uh, and its uh, migrating uh, types of mammals and so forth. I'm sure had we known more and cared more, we would have slowed down, insisted on prior studies that would show what kind of technology was best suited rather than transplanting a te technology from somewhere else. Um, and we wouldn't currently be worrying about whether the government will make the, I think, drastic error of authorizing a pipeline that will do tremendous environmental damage. I think we have to look at, you know, why are we developing the North anyway? Um, I guess for the corporations, it's easy to say what they're doing up there. They're looking for new sources of profit. And when Imperial Oil tells you on its television commercials that it's seeking to lessen Canada's dependence on foreign oil sources, that is nonsense. As for the government, I think they first got involved uh, for the sake of development, development that creates wealth, creates jobs, uh, makes employment available to native people. And secondly, there we're trying to maintain Canada's sovereignty over the Arctic archipelago, 
which was pretty lightly populated and, uh, you know, did Canada really have that much of a claim on it? And thirdly, certainly more recently, trying to avert an energy shortage. Well, with our use of energy resources growing exponentially, is it possible in the long run to avert an energy crisis? Or do we have to rethink, in any case, sooner or later, our whole approach to the use of energy? Energy and other resources which are becoming scarce and which within, say, a century or so, uh, some of which may be, you know, uh, very close to used up by that time. I think it's apparent that what we really ought to be doing, instead of scrambling to find some new oil and gas, which can at best only temporarily delay the final crunch, is looking at what other resources may be available, looking at some of the renewable uh, resources, like solar energy, like wind energy, like methane from sewage and from animal wastes. And of course, I think once you start looking at these things, um, you realize that they are not limitless. Just as even uh, if we went for, opted for nuclear power, it's not limitless. If you want to go to nuclear breeder reactors, you get pretty close to limitless. But I'm not sure that anyone wants to incur the responsibilities for looking after wastes that are going to be with us for thousands of years, very potentially dangerous wastes. So I doubt that breeder reactors are ever going to be the answer. So. Uh, you're looking at limited energy resources. Obviously, we've got to become a conserver society. I, there really isn't time to go into all of that entails. That, that's <laughs> weeks of exploration. But you can be quite sure that if and when, as we must eventually become a conservative society. On the route along the way, there are going to be some very difficult decisions to make because we're going to have to deny ourselves some things we have come to take for granted. And without the kind of ecological understanding that comes from environmental education, I don't have too much hope that we're going to make those choices in the right time frame. You know, we're going to go around locking doors after horses have been stolen, but are we going to face up in time to do the things we must while there are still levels of resources and options open to us that make for a reasonably good life from then on? Well, Inasmuch as this is a conference focused on environmental education, I do want to commend the people who, who organized it, brought it about, and to wish you every success. Thank you. I don't know whether the chairman will agree that there's time for some questioning. How about it, Kim? I see there are a couple of microphones in the aisles. If uh, people would like to use them to make any comments or to ask any questions. In, in regards to the uh, uh, possible 
environmental impacts. Like you, you, you stated that you think that the pipeline across the north would be pretty well disastrous to uh, to the porcupine, caribou herd, and uh, the snow geese. Do they? Do the people proposing this pipeline have uh, qualified? on possible impacts of the uh, pipeline. Uh, certainly those who have done the work on fisheries and on birds uh, come out in their uh, final reports with you know, many recommendations for modification of pipeline routing or systems of burial or for avoidance of certain kinds of activities. And in essence, they do say that there will be a great deal of damage. The people working on caribou um, probably don't say it quite so strongly. But the fact is that that area is uh, just extremely important for calving in the spring and for uh, the summertime, which, by the way, is the critical period for caribou. Uh, we think of ungulates as having a critical period during late winter when food is in short supply. But for caribou, uh, their critical period seems to be through the summer, particularly because of insect uh, pests and the fact that they're uh, recovering from calving, uh, uh, they're uh, more subject to predation. And the place where they seem to fare best is right where the pipeline is going to go. So you take that away from them or inhibit their use of them, and certainly you're going to influence the caribou. Um, I wonder if you could discuss the status of the Eastern Arctic gas pipeline? I don't think that my information is really current. If there has been any recent development, I don't know about it. Let's put it that way. What you have in the Eastern Arctic is uh, fines of gas quite far north. Uh, fines of gas quite far north. Now, they are pretty sizable. Of course, it would take a very sizable quantity to uh, warrant the cost of constructing, uh, doing the very difficult job of constructing a pipeline all that distance southward. Very difficult and very expensive. But I think with, uh, if they could perhaps double the reserves they've already found, they would consider that it warranted a pipeline. Now, no one knows quite yet what the route of the pipeline might be. They're still looking at it because, of course, they don't know where the additional reserves will be found. I think they have some ideas. These people are faced with enormous tasks of piping the gas between islands in the Arctic archipelago, in areas where there are massive icebergs, for instance, where um, the problems of, of even laying pipe below the, through that great thickness of ice when they go between islands uh, still remain to be worked out, but they are confident they can find a way of doing it. And the environmental impact of, of, of um, collecting and transporting gas southward there might not be terribly high. The problem is that gas and oil are commonly found together, and uh, you ha always have the risk of blowout when you're drilling. If it's gas that blows, um, you're not going to do too much damage before you take the do the months of work necessary to seal it off when you're drilling um, in, in deep water. But if it's oil, in a cold environment like that, uh, you would do enormous damage. And you can never be sure when you go to drill for gas that it isn't oil you're going to, 
to uh, the spill should it blow. I'm sorry I can't give you any more exact details about current plans for the polar gas pipeline as it's become known. Uh, because if anything has been uh, finalized by way of planning in recent months, I'm not aware of it. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to end our question and answer period now as we have another speaker coming up. But I would like to thank Mr. Passmore for coming and for sharing his considerable knowledge and expertise with us. Uh, we'll have about a 10-minute break now, and Mr. Tim McKenzie will be the next speaker right here, and he will be speaking on environmental law. I'd also like to remind you that at 6.30 this evening in the cafeteria just below us, Mr. John Harling will be speaking, and he will be showing a film on Outward Bound. Thank you. From 1975 to 1976, he's present counsel for that organization. He's speaking to us this evening on the topic of our environmental laws adequate. Tim McKinsey. This isn't the best position to be in just before dinner, so I'm not going to. Uh, keep you sitting here on your hard chairs for very long. How about everybody moving up? So uh, I've come down from the stage, so how about coming halfway? And we'll try and get this over with as quickly as possible. Actually, I think this was delivered on the part of the organization committee. They know that uh, when you give lawyers the last word, often there never is a last word. So they're going to speed me along as my stomach rumbles and uh, yours rumble in harmony. We'll be able to uh, get through the environmental law and on to dinner. I have uh, very good feelings about the Kootenays. I've, I was up here last year, and of course I worked on the green chain down at Castlegar for a couple of summers. Maybe I should rephrase that. I don't have particularly good memories of the green chain. And I was just thinking as I came up that uh, if two years ago, while I was slaving away on the green chain down there, I could have seen myself standing here in a shirt and tie, I would have been shocked. So uh, let me warn you that uh, the shirt and tie doesn't mean anything except that I've just come from Vancouver. Uh, and the law office, and that's the way people dress there. Maybe tomorrow I'll be able to get rid of the shirt and tie and, uh, and look a bit more natural. I also have to uh, be careful about speaking too long because uh, of my experience the last time I was here. Perhaps you all know Peter Dimitrov. He's a very good friend of mine, and he called me up and invited me to this conference. Well, last year I was here for Habitat, and I gave a little talk. And I thought I'd done fairly well, but uh, lawyers should never take themselves too seriously when they come to Nelson. I thought I'd done fairly well talking about environmental problems, and there was a polite applause, and I sat down feeling very happy with myself. Just after the uh, session broke up, Peter came to me and he said, uh, well now, uh, what about your honorarium? And I said, well, Peter, at the Environmental Law Association, we don't usually ask for honorariums. I think probably your organization could use it a bit more effectively than we could. I said, I said to him, you, you keep the honorarium. He said, that's fine. We'll put it in the improvement fund. And I said, well, that sounds great, Peter. What's the improvement fund? And he said, that's to get a better speaker next year. So you can see I've got to watch my step. I don't see Peter here. Maybe he learned his lesson last year. I'm not going to keep you too long. I think environmental law is a pretty exciting and interesting topic. But uh, then anyone, any lawyer thinks his uh, profession is, is interesting, and any specialist thinks their uh, interest 
is uh, an exciting one. What I plan to do uh, this evening, in a fairly short way, is describe very briefly to you what the West Coast Environmental Law Association has been doing, and then without going into details on the myriad of environmental laws that we have, and also acknowledging that enforcement and litigation are very unimportant aspects of environmental management. In fact, education, in my opinion, and that's the reason you're here, education is the much more important aspect that we should be concerned with. I'm going to talk about problems that we have in Canadian environmental law, reforms that we think, as a result of our experience, are needed, and perhaps illustrate some of these problems and reforms to you by discussing the two or three of the individual cases that have come to us at the Environmental Law Association. Well, what is the Environmental Law Association? It's all things to all people. Sometimes when I'm speaking about the Environmental Law Association, the topic might be titled on being an extremist. Other times, the topic might be entitled on being a reactionary. Now, we are somewhere in between attempting to provide legal services in this area of environmental management to citizen groups and individuals around the province. And it's in connection with our legal advisory service and our retaining of lawyers for citizen groups that we've had first-hand experience with the problems posed by our environmental legislation today. We're concerned also, of course, with education. We think that uh, education may be our most important objective because without education and sensitization, you can never develop that understanding the consensus and the support which is needed to have effective to have effective enforcement of your legislation it's very difficult to get the legislation passed to start with unless you have some sort of public consensus so let's uh, start off by trying to place this in some sort of a perspective this question of environmental law if you pick up, I brought along a couple of my pamphlets, and uh, if you pick them up, you'll get a, a better idea of what we're doing at the Environmental Law Association. Actually, some of our people are, are really into conservation of energy. I have a law student who, who gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning, goes for a run, has a hearty breakfast, he comes into the office at 8.30, and then he sleeps all day. So you see, we're... We have problems with our environmental uh, dedication as well as uh, successes. Barbara Ward and uh, Rene Dubot pretty well summed up the environmental, the ecological problems that surround us in their book, Only One Earth. And I'd like to quote very briefly from that, that book. Alone in space, alone in its life-supporting systems, powered by inconceivable energies, mediating them to us through the most delicate adjustments, wayward, unlikely, unpredictable, but nourishing, enlivening, and enriching in the largest degree. Is this not a precious home for all us earthlings? That's the perspective, and that's the vision that's come to us in our society since the Second World War, as we've discussed such concepts as the spaceship Earth and the closing circle. The problem is finite resources and an increasing demand, and as a result of that, resource use conflicts. And here's where the law comes in, I think. We need uh, laws to help us in our social activities and to develop equitable means to allocate scarce resources. We need laws to somehow resolve the resource use conflicts that are arising everywhere on the planet. 
and they're starting to come to British Columbia as recreationists come into conflict with the logging industry in the Purcells and even in the Slocan Valley as corporate uh, resource developers come into conf conflict with residential residents sorry with residents in communities around uh, their factories through air pollution water pollution we have now over 150 federal and provincial statutes which attempt in many different ways to resolve these problems and set up laws and guidelines well you know when I look at those 150 statutes I remember the gourmet chef who had 150 exotic recipes for omelets but didn't have any eggs we have 150 statutes but we don't have any eggs we're having a little problem with enforcing this legislation and we're having a little problem with getting popular support uh, for the provisions of the legislation in my opinion, our society doesn't yet regard contravention of this environmental legislation as a crime. It's very difficult to get lawyers, the Crown Council around the province, to treat contraventions of environmental law in a serious fashion. That's only one of the problems that we've been concerned with. Your committee has asked me to talk about the adequacy of environmental laws. Well, I've mentioned a few of my ideas about the law. Environmental law, in our opinion, is that branch of the law which is now developing and which attempts to use traditional common law, that is, that great body of, of court decisions that have grown up through the centuries, and all the statute laws to resolve these environmental problems that are arising all around us. So it's a fairly broad topic which can apply to the Valhalla wilderness, to the Purcell wilderness, to clear-cut logging, to pollution control, to the land commission and agricultural land reserves in the Fraser Valley. You name it and we're involved in it. I'm going to mention, as you say, as I as I indicated, some of the reforms that we think are necessary, and then look at three of our case studies. We're convinced now that environmental impact studies have to be required by statutory provision. The present situation is that no statutes in Canada or British Columbia require environmental impact assessments before major developments with significant impact upon the environment. In British Columbia, we have coal guidelines, which are just that, guidelines, <coughs> which leave public participation and the organization of environmental studies up to the, pro the project proponent. At the federal level, we have the environmental assessment review process, which is completely discretionary, can't be triggered by any outside interest group, and is voluntary. That is, the process isn't activated until the proponent department refers the project to the Department of the Environment. Environmental impact assessments. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? All we're asking for is some sort of a, a study to determine what the effect will be on the natural and the social environment so that we can weigh the benefits and the costs before the, the project goes ahead. What we've got now are mitigation studies. That is, the uh, studies aren't done until long after the decision to go ahead has been made. The second reform that we've been involved in and we're very concerned about is freedom of information. Now that's a pretty hot, po 
political topic today. The Prime Minister in the House of Commons last week said that uh, Canadians don't need to know any more about uh, government information. He said uh, Canadians get all the information they need and more than they need. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, right now, just before supper, it would be appropriate for me to permit you to be the first people in the world to hear my new theory of government. I call it the McDonald's theory of government. You know, we do it all for you. Maybe that should be we do it all to you. Did you ever see an Egg McMuffin? Well, I think the information that we get from the federal and provincial government can be related to real hard information, just as an Egg McMuffin can be related to real nourishing food. Okay, Egg McMuffins and uh, Quarter Pounders are provided to you by polite, well-groomed countermen in styrofoam, brightly colored packages, and they're of a uniformly bland consistency, and no one knows what went into them. <laughs> Some of my case studies uh, have led me to believe that that's what we're getting from our Ronald McDonald's in the provincial and federal government today. Okay? Third reform, and there are hundreds of reforms, of course, but I'm only going to uh, subject you to three or four so that we can uh, get on to dinner. I understand there's a vegetarian dinner, so maybe it's inappropriate uh, for me to talk about McDonald's. Although someone once said to me that, uh, you know, by eating at McDonald's, you're not going against your vegetarian principles. I understand they use sawdust in their hamburgers. <laughs> uh, public participation. Now that's a catch word. That sounds pretty trite. But that's the third item that we're concerned about. What is public participation? Well, it's such things as the Community Forum on Airport Development, working with the Ministry of Transport to develop Airport planning, that's people conscious and ecology conscious. It's people participating in pollution control board hearings. It's people really participating in a democratic process. You know, there's a feeling in Canada now, I think, that government is getting more remote from the people. And that, I think, is a result of the increasing complexity of our society. We have a new breed of officials called technocrats, and we have all sorts of tribunals, such as the National Energy Board, the Pollution Control Board, the Land Commission. These people have been, these are experts, and they're very fine people. They've been hired to look after these technical problems. And you know, environmental management is one of the most technical problems. Legislators don't have time. Legislators pass laws with broad provisions. They set up the policy, but it's the people in the tribunals that uh, put the guts into the legislation. It's the people in the, so they're in, in effect, leg many legislators. We believe that uh, the people's representatives should make the laws, but I suggest to you that the laws are really being made in many cases by civil servants and technocrats behind closed doors. And I think that's a cause of real frustration. It's not only a cause of frustration for people in the environmental movement, it's a cause of frustration for people in the consumer protection movement and the civil liberties movement. The fourth thing and the final reform that I'm going to suggest is what we call standing. 
what lawyers call locus standi. For many years, I thought locus standi was some sort of a, a bug that used to that uh, that flew around Saskatchewan, but it turns out after six years of law school, now I realize that locus standi is just an, a Latin word for a place to stand. And the problem is that uh, citizen groups can't get into court to protect public resources. The problem is that the Sierra Club can't get into court to stop mining in Strathcona Park. The problem is that our common laws developed over the centuries on a private proprietary basis. So you only get into court, generally speaking, if you have private property damage. You can't get into court to stop a developer or even an individual from cutting down trees on his land or from cutting down trees on the government's land, cutting down trees in a park, polluting a river. Common law says that that's for the attorney general to decide. You're supposed to go to the attorney general and say, attorney general, Guardy, baby. Guardy Gardim is the Attorney General in, in British Columbia. Your attorney General, as a, as a representative of the Queen, we want you to prosecute this person to protect the Queen's resources. Well, the fact is that the Attorney General is a politician in our, in our governmental setup, and often, due to the well known inclinations of politicians and administrators to retain a low profile, he may be reluctant to act, and that's our experience. Four reforms. That's all. We're not hard to get along with. <laughs> all we're asking is four reforms. Now, this is not political. It's something that crosses political boundaries. Environmental impact assessments, freedom of information legislation, and perhaps I can give you some more details about that if, if you have any questions or you're with, with me in a panel or a workshop tomorrow. Third, public participation. We don't have any statutes in Canada or, Briti or British Columbia that require or give citizens the right to participate in tribunal decisions or to appeal from tribunal decisions, such as decisions of the Pollution Control Board. Only certain classes of objectors can participate in those decisions. And generally speaking, it's up to the director of pollution control. Fourth, standing, locus standi. OK, let me talk very quickly about three case studies. Get specific, get some, some people, interest into uh, the discussion. Afton Mines. Afton Mines was one of the major cases that we had over the past year. Afton Mines proposed to build a major, uh, the first copper mine mill and smelter operation in British Columbia, 10 miles outside of Afton, 10 miles outside of Kamloops, and beginning to, uh, this, that must be a Freudian slip. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem with all of Afton's effluent uh, this being deposited over Kamloops, I begin to think of Kamloops as Afton's uh, property. It's not a difficult mistake to make. People in Kamloops, in the Sierra Club, in SPEC, in the Kamloops Rose Society, in the Kamloops Garden Club, in the Kamloops Snowmobilers Club, we're all concerned about this, the first copper mine mill and smelter. And they wanted to know what is going to come out of the stack of that smelter. How much sulfur dioxide? How much copper? How much mercury? They'd heard of Minamata and they'd heard of grassy narrows. And you know, fishing is the one of the primary tourist attractions of Kamloops. So I think they're concern was justifiable. There were no public hearings held before that operation was allowed to go ahead. There was a public meeting held by the regional district 
considering the zoning, zoning it from rural to industrial, and some representatives from Afton showed up at the meeting, but there was no opportunity to cross-examine them, and no one had any information. The director of pollution control wouldn't give anybody any information. Even after we got involved and started an appeal, the people of Kamloops were only permitted to go to the office and look at what was in the files in the local office. They weren't allowed to take photocopies or have any document to take away with them. The director of pollution control, of pollution control granted an air, water, and land discharge permit to Afton Mines LTD. The air discharge permit contained all sorts of interesting things, very specific restrictions such as the emission from the smelter will be characteristic of smelter emissions. <laughs> the emission from the bag houses will be characteristic of emissions from bag houses. And that really confused me because uh, I had no idea of what a bag house was to start with. Once you start with a bag house, then you have to determine what uh, characteristics emissions have. And this was the first in British Columbia. So they were pretty general. The groups appealed from the, from the issue of the permits. They still didn't have any information. There were 10 groups. They appealed from the, it, the issue of the permits, and we consolidated the groups. We got the senior, senior council. We scrambled all over nor the Pacific Northwest trying to find experts. You know, it's pretty difficult to find experts to participate in these appeals on the public interest side. We went to one uh, consulting engineer, and, he, and we said, uh, we want you to take a look at the flow sheet. He said, fine, I'll be glad to take a look at the flow sheet for $5,000. Some wise guy put on that flow sheet, uh, you know, the flow sheet is the, uh, the diagram of all the conveyor belts and the processes within the mine mill smelter. And someone had put down on the bottom of the flow sheet, flow gently, sweet Afton. <laughs> there wasn't anything gentle about that flow, let me tell you. <laughs> or there won't be anything gentle about it. Well, we had, the, we had a hearing. We, we got all these experts together. We got people from Washington who had had experience with a Tacoma smelter. We pulled in somebody who had had experience with a Sudbury smelter. But we still didn't have any information about what these people were proposing. We looked at the director's files. No information, in our opinion. The environmental uh, impact study that Afton had uh, commissioned had been done only, the, only in the fall. We're talking about uh, the spring of 1976. The permits were issued. The study was started and only finished. It was started in November and was only finished in February, I think. There were no ambient air studies. Afton was just starting to do their ambient air studies when the appeal was being heard. So we were concerned that the director had been pressured into issuing these permits, and we didn't think there was any information in the files that could justify the issue of a permit. That is, our position was there wasn't sufficient information on the environmental impact. Okay, we had the appeal, and it was a long, drawn-out. Not all, it was uh, three days in Kamloops in the middle of the summer in a church basement, and they, the sessions went for nine hours a day, and the testimony was given by, testimony was given by experts at Afton called in from all over North America, and one guy had spent his whole life studying sulfur dioxide, and it looked like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it cost Afton a lot of money. It cost us a lot of money, too. But as all the information came out, and the board, the full board was there with nine members, it became clear that Afton was going to uh, put in the best practical technology. 
they kept accusing us, Afton kept accusing us of talking about other smelters, of talking about things that weren't applicable to the Afton site. They said they were doing the best possible, and yet they said that it was the first one. Well, what are the problems with that hearing? It turned out 